Here, I'll um, I'll just play some filler music for everyone. Would you please? <laughs> that was so cute that it actually did the opposite. It made the thoughts leave my head. <laughs> That is the worst think music, but also the prettiest think music I've ever heard. Hello and welcome to this episode of Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name's Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. She's a linguist. She's a former quiz master. Now she's a contestant. It's Hedwig Hergard. <laughs> yes, in this episode, we're doing the Oslo quiz again, and I'm competing instead of being quiz master. I am worried and nervous. <laughs> I'm so pumped. I get to be on a team with Hedwig, not with stupid Daniel. This is going to be so great. He garnered silver in last year's Oslo Because Language Quiz Challenge, and now he's back to claim the gold. Um, I've, got, I've got gold in my eyes, and I care about nothing else. It's Ben Ainsley. <laughs> well, well, we'll see how that goes. Hello, you two. Thank you for being here. <laughs> our pleasure. Always fun. Yes, today is our annual, I hope it's going to be an annual thing, our annual Oslo Quiz Thing, where Oslo is the Australian Computational and Linguistics Olympiad. It's one of many contests where high school students solve linguistic problems to gain an awareness of linguistics and to compete against other teams. It's heaps of fun. It's educational. We love it. We want to further it, do whatever we can. So that's going to be later on in our show. But before we do that, we better yeah. find out what's going on in the world of linguistics in the week gone past. Before we do that, our last episode was a bonus episode for patrons about the kerfuffle over the humidity and tone paper that lay burning like an underground coal fire all these many years and then burst into life because of a tweet by Decolonial Atlas. Old animosities were laid bare, old wounds refreshed. Stuff we thought had gone under the bridge had clearly not. So we discussed it as well as the implications for linguistics. What should we do? Our next bonus episode is going to be a journal club episode. All the latest research brought to you the best we can without actually reading the articles <laughs> just kidding <laughs> sometimes we did sometimes so make sure and be a patron so you can hear bonus episodes the moment they come out you can hang with us on discord you can get merch depending on your level and of course you can support the show we are because lang pod on patreon and thanks to all our patrons for making this show possible so what's in the news go all right well we always like to keep track <laughs> of racist brand names when they get a change and there's been a new sports team oh what's well, who's changed this uh, time yes Yes, it's, this is in the land of the United States of America, is it not? It is. This story was is, suggested to us by Bob on Discord, Diego on Patreon, and Cheyenne on Facebook. Oh, wow. We got it, we got it from three different channels. Yeah. It's Cleveland's baseball team. The Cleveland, what, were they, what, what was their former name? They were the Indians. Okay. And they had that silly mascot with the grin, you know. Oh, okay. Yep, I remember. Yep. The, the yeah. really, like, the really cartoony one. Yeah. I'm sorry, what sport do they play again? Baseball. Baseball? Baseball. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are changing their name from the Indians to the Guardians after the 2021 season. Okay. Yay. That's cool. I heard they named themselves that after some statues. Is that right? That is correct. If you look at the Hope Memorial Bridge, which connects downtown to Ohio City, I've never been here, but it's flanked by these enormous stone statues that are standing against these beautiful Art Deco pillars. They're really gorgeous. And they are known as the Guardians of Traffic. So the name is inspired by them. And also the team's logo is inspired by the Art Deco flanges that are on the bridge. It's very cool. So does this mean then that they have abandoned all even tangential association with indigenous first nation peoples like it's just a whole different thing now or are the guardians vaguely sort of indigenous -y? i wasn't able to detect any i'm not a cleveland native but i wasn't able to detect any traces of indigenousness in the statues or the name or anything associated i think they're okay steering a bit clear just a total rebrand rebrand 
if I knew anything about baseball, this would be the bit where I was just like, hopefully it'll let them play better too. But I, because sports ball. Maybe it'll just make them play better by not having to have this discussion again and again, because I know they've been having this discussion for like several years now. So maybe just having their team and their players being able to focus on the game instead of the silly names that someone picked for them a long time ago. That sounds like that should make for better sports ball. If the Utah basketball team can call themselves the Jazz, then we can put up with all kinds of changes and incongruities and all that sort of stuff. That is a very dumb name for a team. It's true. Well, they bought the New Orleans team. Oh, it okay. made sense then. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, that does make oh. a lot more sense. <laughs> I was alive for that too. Oh my goodness. Elder Genexa. <laughs> oh, this next story is about cave paintings. It was suggested by Diego on Patreon and Nikolai on Discord. What have we got? Mm, cave paintings. Well, if you go to the Gargas Cave in France, you'll see cave paintings from tens of thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, about thirty to 35,000 years ago. Now, we know that people had language then, but they didn't have writing. They were Homo sapiens. They were just after the Neanderthals. And this cave art has handprints or the outlines of handprints because you put your hand against the wall and then you blow paint on your hand yeah. and it leaves a- So they're like hand a, voids almost. Yeah. Hand turkeys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gobble, 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 they gobble, are. Gobble. Yeah, they which, are. Which I, I understand. I mean, we made them in school as well, and Americans I know make them, but it's when you take your hand on a piece of paper and you trace the outline of your hand. Yeah, yeah I remember that well. I had not made that association, but thank you. Hand turkeys. Wow. Yeah, no, I think that's beautiful. I don't think that, you know, pulls them De down or anything. I think it just all. shows, yeah. No, I think it's great. I think it's beautiful. What you're trying to do is elevate childhood hand turkeys to the level of, like, truly breathtaking cave art rather than bringing cave art down to the level of like kindergarten yeah exactly art. yeah exactly and this isn't by the way my observation it's actually john green said it on the anthropocene reviewed he made the same connection he did a whole episode where he goes into the details of it but i'm not going to do that because i want to know more why we're talking about cave paintings well because some of the hands are missing some fingers okay well okay. that's like not in that yeah like life seemed pretty tough for hunter gatherers Maybe, but it may not be that so many people were walking around missing fingers. It could be another reason. Uh, they were they were hiding mm. their finger underneath their hand when they blew the paint. But why would they do that? That's what I can't quite figure out. Maybe it signified status or role or something in some way. Well, there's a team from the French National Center for Scientific Research. Uh, the acronym is the important letters backwards because French, <laughs> mm -hmm. they think it might be a kind of a signed language. Oh. Oh. Neat. Can't believe, I, I can't like believe it. we didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> We're a linguistics podcast. Like, what else would we be talking about? Now, the question is, why would they think that? And there are a couple of reasons. Number one, the most common sign that you find, there are a bunch of these tokens with fingers that are not depicted. Mm -hmm. The most common sign is all the fingers down thumb out i mean having that many fingers missing come on oh like a sideways okay thumbs up yeah also there are some ways of placing your hands that are kind of easy to make and there are some that are hard for example the all fingers in thumb out that's that's like a one on the difficulty scale of maybe one to mm -hmm. five sure mm -hmm. and they did make a difficulty scale based on the arrangement of muscles if you do the horns of metal Horns of metal. Metal, metal That's horns. pretty easy. Index finger and pinky finger. Index finger, pinky finger, thumb out. Th that might be a two on the difficulty scale, and that okay. appears sometimes as well. Now, some ways of placing your hands are really, really hard. See if you can even do this one. I can't. Put all your fingers in, except for ring finger. I can't oh, do it. Oh, I know this. I've tried this before. It's really difficult because the joints are such that your uh your ring finger so that's the finger next to the right or the left of your pinky mm -hmm. it's connected in a in a funny way to your middle finger your we call it the long finger because it has to be the longest mm -hmm. you, you you can't physically do it easily you can't hold that if you want to do a um rude gesture <clears throat> yeah. with only that finger it's almost impossible like i'm trying to do it now and i can't even race it yeah the magician Doug Henning could do it. His dexterity was legendary. Wow. And that one, that's a five on the difficulty scale, and it never occurs on these cave paintings. Oh, so are we thinking that this is like sort of vaguely following the rules of 
spoken linguistics where like really, really, really hard stuff to say happens comparatively much less of the time and really easy things to say happens all the time. Yeah, if it's super hard, then they're not going to be using that as any kind of signal. Or try this one. All the rest of your fingers out except for bend your middle finger, put middle finger in, and pinky in. Oh my god, that's the same right. thing. Yep. The, it's, it's, it's this ring <laughs> finger. It's I swear, it's something about the anatomy. Like it's joined up to. It's just I'm trying. Oh yep. my god! And you can feel it in the forearm when you try and force it. Like when Damn you it, pull ring. It up, you can feel it like sort of down below your wrist. Yeah. Oh, it feels so bad. That's a four on the difficulty scale, and it never occurred in these cave paintings. Nothing above a two in difficulty. So. They might have used these signals when they needed to be quiet, like when they were hunting. In fact, lots of people do that today. And then they sprayed these signals on the walls of the cave. Interesting. <gasps> what do you think? I like it. Hmm. I, I mean, we know, for instance, in... I, I, I can only speak in the Australian Indigenous languages context, but that signed languages and, like, adjacently signed components of the language is a super common feature for Indigenous languages here in Australia, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it stands to reason, like, if it's here, like, there's no reason why it wouldn't be in other times and places. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah, I yeah. could see how you would sort of ic icon iconographically mm -hmm. render elements of this signed part of your language onto a wall. I mean, that, that plays for me. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. The jump from spoken language to written representation is a really big jump because speech doesn't look like anything, but signed languages do look like something, and we can represent them visually. Mm -hmm. So if this is right, then the first instance of writing or something like writing wouldn't be archaic Sumerian from 5,000 years ago, but these signs from 30,000 years ago. That's super That's interesting. Super that is cool. super duper interesting. I like that. That was really cool. Yeah, let's go on. Mm -hmm. um, Peppa Pig effect. Oh. Oh, no. Are we? No. Oh, my God. Are we really? <laughs> we really are. I know where this story is going. This okay, story you came tell me. up where is it going? so many times in my news feed. And it's because this, is, this, this story is what I call boomer love story. This is the kind of story that boomers <laughs> just froth at the mouth for. Yeah. The story goes, here in Australia... We have a children's television show that is very, very popular called Bluey. Now, I stand this show just as hard as anyone else who is a parent. Me here. too. Big time. I'm on the right track here, by the way. Right, Daniel? Don't just let me, like, carry yes, on you. in this. Yeah, okay, good. You're doing great. You're doing yeah. great. Bluey is so universally adored here in Australia that in the rarest of incidents, incidences, an Australian media product is actually getting quite popular outside of Australia. It doesn't normally go that way. Normally it goes the other way. We get everyone else's pop culture and we love that. Um, but apparently Bluey is doing very well in other markets, markets such as the United States, where apparently certain younglings are starting to speak in an Australian accent to a certain degree and use certain Australian slang, such as most notably in all of the headlines I saw for the boomers in Australia, Dunny. Dunny. Dunny? There was a really good episode about language where they talked about Dunny. I, I recommend Sorry. everyone watch that one. Dunny means toilet. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's related to dung. That's where it comes from. Diminutive of dung. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Also, kids calling breakfast brekkie. Okay, so that's the story. Is it plausible? Is there an epidemic of Australian accents sweeping the USA? Categorically, no. I believe so because I <laughs> get accents from my podcasts. Do you? And I feel, yeah, I think I do. We do know that accent-wise, you're very malleable. Yeah, Hedvig, you are yeah. the most porous person <laughs> I have ever met for accents in my life. You are the, the worst possible benchmark for this question. <laughs> or the best. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I can believe it. Okay. Can I, can I guess what happened? Uh, what, what happened, Ben? I suspect that the kid of some journalist in the States said a thing once or twice and they were like, ha oh, isn't this cute? And they wrote probably a relatively innocuous story about it. Then a journalist in Australia was like, oh, bloody too, right? This will make all of the uh, 50 to 65-year-old boring suburban market of Australia just click on this link a bunch of times. I'm going to write heaps of stories about Seppo kids with Aussie accents. 
and it's not a thing. Dang, Ben, I think you uh, got this article right. So I noticed that the the coverage of the Bluey effect in 2021 is much smaller than the Peppa effect as it was covered in 2019. The, there were stories about the Peppa effect everywhere, but the Bluey effect is, as far as I can tell, down to one interview with an ABC presenter in Melbourne and a real estate agent in Massachusetts. That's about it. <laughs> By the way, I just want to state, people are listening to this and being like, oh, Ben like, knew the article and so I didn't click on any of these articles. If it hasn't been made clear to you, I despise this kind of journalism as just like the worst, <laughs> lowest form of just what? boring, but, boring news. I didn't know any of this. But, I was just able to guess all of this because this is how dumb and predictable this stuff is. But Ben, it doesn't do any harm and it makes people feel good. It's wholesome. It's Maybe it's boring. That's its worst crime. And maybe it's not entirely true, but it doesn't do any harm and it is cozy. Let's talk about the plausibility. I don't think it's very plausible that kids are acquiring British or Australian accents from Peppa Pig or Bluey. Parents and caregivers have a much bigger impact than television. As we often say in socio, people talk like the people near them, not like the people on TV. But on the other hand, lexically, I can see them picking up words. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think I think you could... So you're saying that accent is pronunciation and lexicon is not accent? That is kind of what I'm getting to, yes. Okay, fair enough, I guess. I mean, um, not systematically, but for, for individual words. For example, my four-year-old daughter loves go-jetters, and there was a show about geezers. And I'm like, geezers? What are they talking about? It was geysers, what I say in my US English, but she started saying geezers. Because it's a UK mm. show, that's what she heard. Input is input, and if a child is yeah, going to yeah, pack yeah. on ten words a day, they've got to get it from somewhere. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. No, so picking up some vocab, reasonable, uh, changing their pronunciation of words they already know, less plausible. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and causing widespread societal accent change, very, very implausible. Yeah, like hot, just impossible. I, I would, yeah. The the more interesting aspect for me is the moral panic aspect, which hasn't shown up just yet, but we're keeping an eye on it. <laughs> Finally in the news, there's a, a new podcast in town with some old friends. Ooh. Ooh. Do you know this one? I do. I just wanted okay. to sound surprised because I'm so excited about it, and I don't <laughs> know how to sound excited without sounding surprised. <laughs> I'm excited about it. <laughs> What's the new podcast? I don't know about this. It's the Spectacular Vernacular podcast. It's a new language podcast from Slate to replace Lexicon Valley, which John McWhorter took independent. And this one, Spectacular Vernacular, has our three-time guests, Ben Zimmer and Nicole Holiday. Yes, they finally have their own podcast. Oh, good for them. Yeah. That's amazing. Welcome to the Linguistic Podcast family. Yeah. Maybe that's the thing as well. If we have guests on for long enough, they get their own podcasts. Yeah, that's <laughs> like... We're bored of talking to Daniel, Ben, and Hedvig. Let's get our own podcast. But it is fun. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. talked to uh, John Linnell from They Might Be Giants about his album All in Latin, which is Roman songs. And there's even a wordplay bit at the end because Ben Zimmer does uh, crosswords. And they even put out the call, if you want to play on air with us, then send us an email. Uh, so I wondered, maybe, uh, are you two, uh, you know, busy later? Maybe we could uh, send them an email. And... Yeah, uh, cool. yeah. Yeah. Wait, so what, what are you doing crosswords on air? So their last one was hypervocalic words, words with all the five vowels and potentially in order. So, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can I uh, roster in Steve for this? Because he's really good at the Will Short um, crosswords in oh. the New York Times. Okay. And so he's that kind. He's got that kind of brain, and I, I don't. <laughs> All right. Head figure out. Steve's in. Just kidding. Great. Spectacular vernacular. Check it out on Slate, and there'll be a link on our blog. Talk, uh, talk the talk Because Nice one. Good catch. We are back, and with us now is a whole bunch of great people working on a great project, the annual Ausclo Competition, which is short for the Australian Computational and Linguistics Olympiad. So let's meet the people that we are talking to. First of all, I want to start with Elizabeth Meyer. Elizabeth, hello. Great to have you. Thanks for coming. Hello, Daniel and everyone, and thanks for inviting me. This is your second time around. It's my second time around. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you want to know something about Ausclo? I would love to hear something about Ausclo. Well, the abbreviation is the Australian Computational and Linguistics Olympiad. It is a state and a national competition for secondary students for years 9 to 12. 
And it's fun and engaging, and it's all about cracking the code of an unknown language, logic, deduction, problem-solving, lateral thinking, and teamwork. In reality, what it does, it introduces students to language puzzles from which they can learn about the richness on diversity and systematic nature of language while exercising natural logic and reasoning skills uh, in a very fun way. So typical problems, for example, would be deciphering Roman scripts, uh, translating tasks involving morphological and syntactic analyses, and computational linguistic tasks, searching for phonological rules, pattern recognition, and linguistic reconstruction. If you want to get an idea, or better idea, of what I'm talking about, you can visit our website, oslo.org.au, and you can download a preparation package and look at all the puzzles that are up there and start having fun. It is a lot of fun. What are some of the best things that you think Oslo accomplishes? It's a great uh, gateway to uh, bring students to linguistics. And uh, after that, uh, there, there are some, for example, in Melbourne, there are, uh, I think, courses in year nine to 12 about linguistics. And that is possibly the only state that actually has courses uh, on linguistics. And getting students into studying linguistics and from there into becoming teachers or becoming linguists and going on field work and researching the fantastic languages in the world, wherever they are, like I'm going to the Amazon whenever I can, just to talk to the people there and learn about how they speak, that would be great. That is great. We are also joined by the wonderful teacher and students from Melbourne Girls Grammar School. We have with us English teacher at Melbourne Girls Grammar School and Oslo coach Victoria Papoyano and our extremely successful Oslo students, Chelsea Hinn, Jessica Lee, Rosie Nguyen, and Audrey Choi. Hello. Uh, let's start with you, Victoria. Hello. Thank you for getting this together. You're the teacher that, uh, that steered this crew. Thanks, Daniel. Yes, I am. I organized uh, Oslo for a couple of years now um, at the school and got the lovely uh, team of four who made it to the finals this year. What? What is it that keeps you going on this? Why are you so keen on Oslo? Uh, I teach English language, which is the linguistic stream of the VC English and have always just loved languages and seeing students um, get involved and get really passionate and fiery when they're competing um, in teams school has been really enjoyable and we started the first year with a very small team of I think four, only four students and this year we had 32 compete I'm pretty sure it was oh, so um, that's huge that's kept me going it's just seeing that you know kids are interested and when you offer those opportunities um, they just go for it and love it wow well thank you for what you do I'm gonna go to our students Chelsea Audrey Jessica Rosie what was the experience like for you Audrey you want to start us off um, to be honest, at the beginning, it was um, very relaxed because a lot of people were doing it. So I think this is the first year that we actually did it because obviously last year when we first entered the senior years program and got the opportunity to do it, we couldn't because of, you know, lockdown and everything. So when we first did it this year, it was a big event and we all kind of gathered in one space, lots of students. So it was um, really fun, honestly, to begin with. Were the puzzles hard? Uh, oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> Don't tell me about it. <laughs> uh, no comment, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of you have any plans to keep going with linguistics? Uh, was this the thing that maybe got you onto it or mm, maybe not? Jessica, what do you think? Um, so actually, yeah, this competition was actually my first introduction to linguistics, um, the actual subject of it. I kind of had an understanding of it, but I wasn't really... Um, super, super interested into it until now. So um, this competition has really opened my eyes up to other studies that I might be taking to the future. I've also studied a few languages since I was young, so uh, Chinese and Vietnamese as well. So that all of these combined together has really just opened my eyes as uh, this might be a future career path that I may want to take. Awesome. Wow. Chelsea, what do you got? Yeah, actually, um, for the first semester of school, I actually picked uh, an English language elective. So that was sort of my first taster of linguistics. And then this linguistics com competition came along and I hadn't heard anything about it until this year. So, yeah, it was just really exciting. And I guess you could say I was just completely thrown headfirst into the world of linguistics. But I mean, after the first taste, I mean, I definitely want to continue. 
Awesome. What do you say, Rosie? Yeah. Um, honestly, it was pretty much a very similar experience for me as well. Um, Ozclo was really the first linguistics, you know, like challenge competition thing that I had ever done. And it was really fun. I, I didn't really see it as a competition. I just saw it as like an opportunity to have a bit of fun with my friends. And, you know, we've gone pretty far. So I'm pretty happy with that. My favorite kind of humble flex, right? Uh, yeah, I like. I wasn't even like trying to win. I was just trying to have a good time. But it turns out that I just destroyed the competition anyway. So like, pretty cool, pretty cool. Well, you were finalists. You were second in the junior competition, which is really quite an accomplishment given that there were so many teams working on this. So congratulations. We are also joined by Henry Wu, our quiz master. Henry, what's your role in this? Hello, hello. So uh, I've been involved in Ozclo for a long time now. I kind of represent like the life cycle of the Ozclo participant because uh, I started <laughs> off as an ex, like as a participant at school in 2015 and 16. I got to go to the International Linguistics Olympiad in 2016. And uh, since I graduated high school, I then went into like organizing Ozclo. And so I've been helping out with the organization for the last four years now, I guess. And... Yeah, and met all these amazing linguists in my linguistics education at university, like Hedvig and Elizabeth. And uh, now I'm running this quiz. Um, yes, you, <laughs> the apex <laughs> of the life cycle. Mm. And it's going to be a good one. We've got four different rounds, and this will test your medal not against only each other, but against Ben and Hedvig. Yay! <laughs> they are <laughs> they are formidable. Um, yeah, they're, they're a thing mm -hmm. in one way or another. <laughs> I um, invigilated the IOL individual round in Germany this year, and I had a look at the problems, and I had exactly the same time as the competitors, six hours. I had nothing else to do than sit there and look at them and make sure they weren't cheating, which... is boring. It's so boring, yeah. <laughs> and I looked at the problems, and I was like, I don't, I can't. I Okay, I remember when my brain was able to do this. I'm able to do other kinds of linguistics, but that was a rough problem set. That was difficult. And you're a professional linguist. And I'm a professional linguist. Like there's a little DR right in front of your name mm. that is specifically about linguistics. And you were still looking at the questions and being like, oh, dip. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. All right. We need some team names. So perhaps in chat, why don't you talk to each other? Ben and Hedvig have a secret audio channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find out what you want to call yourselves. Hedvig, can you okay. still hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Excellent. Daniel. And, ben. and <laughs> I can hear, oh, we're on to a good you. start. <laughs> Ooh, maybe, a good start. Maybe that should be our team name. We can be like oh, no. um, Daniel, Daniel Strike Through, Ben and Hedvig. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's do something. You had all white men tears last time. Let's do something. Oh, yeah, Are okay. you, do you count as millennial? Yes, technically, just. I'm an elder millennial. Is Wait, that aren't you also an elder millennial? I'm millennial, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you're like an older one. Like, we're not that far I'm apart in age. 32. You're only like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're definitely an elder millennial. Let's just be the elder millennials. Yes. Okay. Okay, we're ready to come back. We have decided, Daniel, that yes. uh, Team Hedvig Ben shall be known and must be known by all participants as the Elder Millennials. And so you shall be. <laughs> How close are you to Generation Y? Uh, me? Very far. <laughs> like, not very close at all. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm right down the other end of that little generational bracket. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I had okay. to do algebra in my head to calculate my age. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, 2000 and... Carry the, carry the one. I keep forgetting if it's 2020 or 2021. I feel like those two years are, like, the same. It's been like an 18-month fugue state of time. Yeah, fair enough. Chelsea and Audrey, have you got a name for us? Um, yeah, so in tribute to one of the questions that we did um, in the Nationals round of Ozclo, our team name is going to be... Um, Latvian Winnie the Pooh, where <laughs> Jess and I had to <laughs> translate Winnie the Pooh into Latvian. And it was, we've never done that before. So, yeah. We're so traumatized from that experience. <laughs> 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 oh, 
I don't know about anyone else, but the the picture that I conjure up when I the the evocative image of Latvia and Winnie the Pooh, having travelled through Latvia, is just like like one of those like super off brand Soviet era Western like knockoffs, like Winnie the Pooh, but just with like two little dots for eyes and just like hair. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Every character is Eeyore. This great Soviet children's television. <laughs> <laughs> like Worker and Parasite. I love that one. <laughs> Simpsons sorry, call back. Sorry. Yep. Okay, let's go to Jessica and Rosie. What do you want your team name to be? Um, so a bit of background. Before before this little podcast um recording session, our team, our team of four, assumed that we were gonna be a team of four. And so we had a little bit of a discussion on team names and we had come up with the Wizards of Ozclo. Um, oh, so, oh, damn. Uh, so, damn. so in honor of that, we have decided to call ourselves the Better Dorothy and Toto. Oh, Toto. I like <laughs> it. <Dog. laughs> so no stolen valor here, but no, still shade no. being thrown. I approve. The Better Dorothy and Toto. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Great. We've got names. All right. It's time for round one. This one's the warm-up round. Henry, do you want to get us started? Yeah. And I just want to say it's it's called the warm-up round in tribute to the last Oslo quiz uh, in which Hedvig made a warm-up round where the points actually counted. So in the same way, <laughs> <laughs> these, these points do count. It's one point for each correct answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Starting cold. All right, let's do it. Okay. So the first question is, the stories feature on Instagram was launched in which year? It's multiple choice. A, 2016, B, 2017, or C, 2018. Okay. Go ahead and meet yourselves if you wish. Let's drop into chat. Ben and Hedvig, you can discuss on your secret audio channel that nobody else can hear. I don't know. If, yeah, contain your surprise. I don't use Instagram stories. Um, <laughs> I feel like it was... Recent. No, I was going to go the other way. I use Instagram. Okay. I use Instagram and I feel like Instagram stories was only introduced to combat like TikTok or no, uh, Snapchat. No, yeah, when that's, Snapchat that's what became I was going to say. When Snapchat became a thing, Instagram so, got Instagram stories. So when do we feel like, I feel like Snapchat has been around for a while now though. But it only got pop. Mm. So Not with the little ones. So what was it, 2017, 2018? 16, 17 or 18. Okay. Uh, should we split uh, okay. the difference and say 17? Yeah. Okay. I agree with that. Ready. Okay, we're ready to... Okay. Was it 2016, 2017, or 2018? I'm going to go with the elder millennials first. We think it's 2017. Okay. Let's hear from Latvian Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> you think it's 2016. 2016 is your guess. And the better Dorothy and Toto. We also said 2016. Okay. Well, Henry? Oh, no. The correct answer is 2016. <laughs> oh, that's one point for Latvian Winnie the Pooh and the better Dorothy and Toto. It's fine. It's fine. The only way I can explain this is that when you're older, years tend to blend together. And that's, that's <laughs> all I'm going to say about that. Question two. Which of the following pairs of plants do not belong to the same family? So we're talking about genetic family here. Is it A, cherry trees and roses? B, water lilies and lotuses? Or C, Legumes and wattle, the wattle plant. You're trying to find the two that do not belong to the same family. Okay, drop into chat. I feel like it's water lilies and lotuses. I was about to say the same thing. Seems like such a trick question, doesn't it? Because you would think that they yeah. are the exact same family. But then again, wattle is Australian. Or is is Henry doing like a cunning double, double reverse mm -hmm. blind kind of thing? Yeah, he might. Is Wattle only in Australia? Uh, I don't think so. Sorry, I think can you just ask like repeat the last one again? Yeah, legumes and wattle. Legumes oh, like okay. the, the legumes vegetable. Legumes are yeah. nitrogen Thank fixing, you. right? Which is like their key characteristic. They take nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it in the soil. I'm just trying to remember if wattles do as well. I just know that I'm a vegetarian and I should eat a lot of legumes because they contain protein. Uh, um, are you ready? Come on back. I'm going to uh, say... I think water lily. We both okay. thought it yeah. first. Okay. So, okay. yeah. This is fun yeah, yeah, being yeah. on it's, the it, competing on... side. I didn't. <laughs> last time I was on the quiz master side. Now I'm like, oh, this is. 
This is a different side. I like it. It's it's the same with Dungeons and Dragons, right? Like DMing can be really engaging, but it's just so tiring. But like being a player mm. is just heaps of fun because you could just kick back and be like, all right, I'm going to do this now. Well, I'm still having yeah, fun. Yeah, thanks, Daniel, <laughs> for taking it. <laughs> okay, let's hear from the better Dorothy and Toto. We still haven't really decided, but we'll just, I guess we'll go with the third one, legumes and wattle. Legumes and wattle is your answer. Lavi and Winnie the Pooh. Um, we thought cherry and rose because wattle and legumes somehow seemed a little bit too obvious because they're both interesting. They sound different, so they must be the same, according to the rule of quiz night perversity. Yep. Right. Okay, and Elder Millennials. Uh, we, w- greatly, we have split the difference exactly, so we've got three teams, three answers. We went with lotuses and water lilies because we think that Henry is a cunning quiz master who has deliberately dropped some deliberately similar seeming things which are actually not related at all. Hmm, let's see if this holds. Henry, what you got? Well, Ben has hit the nail on the head. The answer is B. <laughs> water lilies and lotuses, which are... Yes! Oh, I'm so happy! So happy. And let this yeah, be a lesson too. to everyone. Metagaming is absolutely a valid strategy to win. <laughs> but he can be double bluffing as well. That's the difficult yeah. part. We actually, Henry, just so you know, like inside baseball, we actually specifically immediately both went, we think Henry's doing a thing where blah, 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 blah. But then we both also immediately went, but hang on, he could be doing a double psych out like switcheroo. <laughs> this is just the warm up oh, yeah. round. So like, How clever is he? <laughs> Oh, no. It doesn't get hardball until later. Fair enough. Hmm. Okay, so that's a point for the elder millennials. Let's go on to number three, Henry. The third, the third uh, question, hopefully, is quite an easy one. And it's which city will hold the 2024 Olympic Games? Is it Los Angeles, Paris, or Brisbane? Hmm. Los Angeles, Paris, or Brisbane, 2024 Olympic Games. Why did he say this was easy? Is it Brisbane? It's Los Angeles. Okay. Ben's back. I've just started. I've realized, Daniel, this is this is like you would think that a person who is A, a teacher and B, on a podcast that's supposed to be like engaging and entertaining would not necessarily be super competitive. But just then when I had my microphone muted, but Hedvig and I could like talk to each other, I've started moving my face behind the microphone so that they can't <laughs> lip read. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that they would, but I'm still just like, ooh, the outrage. There's, there's a cunning advantage. Number one, lip reading is hard. Number two, when it's your birthday, I'm going to invent a quiz night where everyone pretends to get them wrong and all the questions are easy, just so that oh, you will have a great that's time. evil. I love it. Um, mm. Lip reading, I would put to you, sir, is not hard when you have established that there is only three possible ah, options. Yes. Yes, of course. Mm, yeah, that's, that is. Neither is brain scanning, for that matter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's start with Latvian Winnie the Pooh. Do you have an answer? Um, yes, yeah, so we don't think it's Brisbane, so we just met Paris. Okay, yeah. Paris is your answer. Let's go to uh, the Elder Millennials. Uh, we went with Los Angeles. Okay, and uh, the better Dorothy and Toto. We went Paris. <laughs> Paris it is, and Henry, answer please. And the correct answer is Paris. Oh, (laughs) I was so certain. Is Los Angeles the one after that? Yeah. Los Angeles again? Really? Okay. Very good. Oh, my God. And they were awarded the same year, which makes it more confusing. So they were awarded at the same time, the two consecutive Olympiads. Sorry, Mm. Hedvig. I came into that one strong. I was just like, is Los Angeles? No contest. Yeah. Ben just told me, oh, it's this. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. Fair enough. <laughs> sorry, sorry, stupid, stupid, stupid. Uh, don't worry, it's still anybody's game. That was round one. And so far, Lavia and Winnie the Pooh and the better Dorothy and Toto have twice the score that the elder millennials do. Let's go on. Round two. Henry, take us there. So round two, I've called off-brand IOL. And so <laughs> these are questions which take IOL questions as their starting points, but do not necessarily require IOL knowledge to solve. It's trivia. That's IOL flavoured. I love this. Henry, you're my favourite. <laughs> Please give us more points. Very good. Right. So, and, okay, and this round is two points per correct answer. So we've raised the... Yikes. Okay, p- question one. Problem one in the 2007 contest held in St. Petersburg in Russia was about Braille, the tactile writing system consisting of raised dots arranged in rectangular cells, devised by the Frenchman Louis Bray, originally for transcribing French orthography. But when did he invent this system? 
Was it 1724, 1824, or 1924? It's one of the 24s, but when did Louis Braille invent the Braille system? Okay, I think it's it's like either 17 or 18, like it's yep. old. Yep, I agree. And because the way Henry worded the question was like, when did this guy originally come up with a thing that was not originally for oh, so- deaf people, right? Yeah. Like the way to transcribe orthography. Exactly. Or th- right over. So 1724, um, they invented a lot of stuff related to the French Revolution. That's what I was thinking, but that's were around about people that time. too busy murdering everyone and liberating things to like do- But they also were like, we're going to make a new calendar and uh, okay. Meh, okay. Meh, meh, okay. Meh, meh, meh. Yep. I reckon 17 then. I think so. I mean, it's the French though. There probably was another revolution at 1827 as well. <laughs> Wait, what year? French Revolution is 1714? I would not know. I was not educated in mainland Europe, so we did not learn those things. <laughs> what? Yeah, no. Everyone like, just escaped. Steve also was like, oh, I'm, yeah, mm, French Revolution, uh, I'm a bit unsure. Oh. Well, I mean, the the French were classically his enemy, so um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I'm, I would guess 1724, yeah. Give me a hoy when you're back. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, when was Braille invented? Was it 1724, 1824, or 1924? We are back to the elder millennials. What do you got? We think it's 1724. We Very think good. it's to do with... F- I'm, I'm not going to say the reason, because that... No, 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 no. Oh. no. I think we should. I think we should, so that we look dumb if we're wrong and we look hell smart if we're right. Um, oh. <laughs> I think it's around about the time when they start inventing all the stuff related to the French Revolution. They invent, like, a calendar. They invent... They just turn everything upside down. Yeah. Heady days. Heady days. We go yeah. to Latvia and Winnie the Pooh. We said 1824. Okay. Any particular reason? If you don't uh, want to say, that's fine. If it'll give things away. We just sort of wanted to go somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the enlightened centrist approach. Very good. Okay. And now we're going to the better Dorothy and Toto. Um, yeah, we went 1824 as well. I oh, guess. Oh, no. 17 no it's it was a complete guess 1724 just seemed a bit early and 1924 seemed a bit late so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. henry you know what's funny is that hedwig and ben had the correct reasoning but, but they the didn't wrong... know the history because oh. <laughs> the french revolution happened at the end of the 18th century and so Yay. the correct answer is 1824 oh yeah it's 1789 <laughs> But Do you, you know look the worst how smart. Part? Edwig looked at me and was just like, yeah, you know, the year that the French Revolution was. And I just shot back to her straight away. Well, I wasn't educated in mainland Europe, so we don't focus on those things because we're just like peasants in the countryside. <laughs> By the way, Hedvig <laughs> speaks French. Just throwing it out there. I know it was 1700s. <laughs> just, but yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Well, things are looking grim for the elder millennials, but yeah, let's go on to question not, two. In so many more ways than one. But yes, in this <laughs> quiz too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question two. Problem three in the 2009 contest held in Wrocław in Poland was about a certain tradition associated with Burmese names. What is this tradition? Is it A, certain sounds are considered masculine or feminine and thus avoided on opposite gender names? B, names are given beginning with certain letters based on the day of the week on which the child is born? Or C, Names get longer the more children a mother has. So the eldest born has sh- a short name. I want all of these to be true because they're all awesome. Me, yeah. Just uh, run those bests again, Henry, if you would. Yes. So A, certain sounds masculine, feminine, and thus avoided on opposite gender names. B, names are given beginning with certain letters based on the day of the week on which the child is born. And C, the names get longer the more children a mother has. I like all of these. Let's see what you mm. think. Drop in a chat. I'm going to start with Latvia and Winnie the Pooh. Did you think it was? Because certain sounds are considered masculine and feminine and thus avoided in opposite gender names. Is it based on the day of the week where the child is born or more children equals longer and longer names? Um, We ended up going the last one that more children um, equals longer names. Honestly, because I'm the third sibling, so that would be really cool if that was me. (laughs) Like a Pokemon, right? More of all (laughs) equals longer name. Okay, cool. Let's go with uh, Better Dorothy and Toto. Um, We said feminine and masculine just because a lot of languages do change, like the wording of um, certain 
things change depending on gender. So yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Very commonly used strategy. Okay. And elder millennials. We also discussed the idea of names sort of being a little bit different based on like gender sounds, but we actually Hedvig reckons she's on this one. The doctor in front of her name has come to the fore mm. and she reckons that, and I'm throwing you completely under the bus if we get this wrong, Hedwig. <laughs> I, I don't reckon anything. I was at the Olympiad and I remember this. Oh, <laughs> So I feel I feel bad, Henry, but I but but we can also test if the elder really is true in my name in our team name because I could also be remembering it wrong. Yeah, it's completely totally. possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we so days of the I'm week. gonna I'm gonna yeah days of the week. Okay, what is it, Henry? It is indeed days of the week. I hadn't considered <gasps> that Hedwig might have been at one of these. Oh, so, <laughs> I known, oh I, I feel bad now. Oh, I shouldn't have said it. Oh no. I thought yeah. it was. I thought it was interesting that you were outing that you were just explicitly cheating on this question. Sorry, <laughs> I'm putting, sorry. I'm putting, I'm putting your two but points also, in a parenthesis. We we are really losing, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> points wise. So I feel like if I can, I can't remember my age. So if I can remember an IOL question from many years ago, I feel like that's right, it's fair some game. Sort of feat. You're operating with something of a sort of in a sporting context, a handicap. So you need to yes, sort of like take the points where you can get them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, honestly, honestly, we thought that was the least plausible answer. <laughs> <laughs> it is a weird one. To be fair, it was a very tricky question, um, and. I'm sure that all three of these traditions exist in, you know, a whole bunch of different cultures, but uh, the days of the week is actually associated with astrology. So it's like auspicious uh, days right, that right, right. people associate with. I just love the idea of somebody saying, well, here are my seven children, Maiden, Taden, Waden, Thaden, Freyden, and Satan and Satan. Does that mean one that was born on Saturday, the other was Sunday? No, they're twins. I'm interested, Daniel, that you went with the Aiden um, suffix of names as well, because in teaching circles, and I don't know, Victoria, if you want to agree with this or not, but everyone whose name is or ends in Aiden is a bad person. <laughs> what? I, I knew entire families. They were Aiden, Braden, Caden, and Jaden, and Hayden, you know. Ben, you yeah. can't ask that of a teacher. Can't comment with uh, a girl's school and... Oh, fair enough, mm, fair enough, mm, fair enough, mm, fair enough, fair mm, enough. Mm, mm. That was, by the way, an incredibly diplomatic evasion. I think you have <laughs> a strong future in politics. <laughs> Let's now go on to question three, if you would, Henry. Okay, so third question is, the team problem at the 2014 contest held in Beijing in China featured an Armenian translation of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But how many languages has the document been officially translated into? Is it 329, 429, or 529? 100 languages is a lot. That's a good spread. How many languages has the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights been translated into? 329, 429, or 529? So um, this isn't the kind of but i did a i did a blog post that i think henry has read which is like the most intertranslated things and human declaration of declaration of human rights is really high up there um bible's really high up and then it's like pinocchio is one of the highest fictional ones pinocchio, um, yeah, right. and oh, yeah. i am fairly sure it's actually 329 because they do it for for the major languages of well, the countries, and there's like a hundred and you'd, you'd have every member nation right which is like 180 yes, exactly. something and then... Yeah. Uh, I think it's 193 with South Sudan or something like that. Uh, but but then it's it's like how many plus ones do they do? Because even yeah. if they do... A plus one for every <sighs> single one of them. Oh, that would get you up into the 429s just about. Yeah. If you do plus but one, a lot and change. Of countries, don't but have a plus one. a lot of countries one. don't have major... Um, like Iceland won't have yep. a major other language. True. True. And if yeah. that is, if they would, it would probably be like English or Swedish or Norwegian, which already would be translated. Do you think they've translated? Because um, it's not a long document, right? No, it's super short. Like, would they uh, have? Would they have like um, translated it into like a bunch of indigenous languages, like in Australia, for example? They would have translated think? into some, I think. I know that on Omniglot, um, you can get it for a lot of languages. Omniglot. When you're ready, just come back. Give us a point. Okay. I think you you want you want to go you want to go the four twenty nine. Your initial thing Something was 329. Like let's go 3, 329. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Ready. We're also ready. 
We're back to the elder millennials. Was it uh, how many how many languages has the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights been translated into? So, is it my turn to explain our reasoning on this one, Hedvig? Okay. Uh, we thought that with 190 something and change member nations, if we did like a plus one for maybe like a bit over half of those nations, that'd get us close to 329. So that's what we've stuck with. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, Lavi and Winnie the Pooh. Oh, okay. So I'm not very sure anymore because originally I just thought we, we were just thinking, you know, there are a lot of languages in the world, you know, somewhere upwards of 6,000, 7,000. So surely it would be a high number. <laughs> be courageous. Stick with your instinct. What did you have? Okay. So originally we said that we'd go 529 just because there are so many languages in the world, you know, hopefully they try and accommodate most of them. <laughs> What's this originally stuff? If you could, would you change now? I might. We might have gone 429 just because okay. it's somewhere in the middle. Well, you can't. Let's go on to the better <laughs> Dorothy and Toto. Um, so our answer is 329. Okay. Um, same reasoning as... Um, the elder millennials. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> we are what All we right. are. Take us there, Henry. <laughs> well... Audrey's reasoning was completely right. Uh, it's actually 529. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Hey, You've Hedvig, got to believe in yourself. We're really bad at this. <laughs> I, think you, I think you might be doing worse than Ben and I did last year. No, no, no. You're doing great. It's really, oh. it's super close. There's like one or two points spread. Don't worry. How's, how's the implication there? Ouch. Still anybody's game. Question four. Okay. I think we only have two points, Ben. <laughs> No, you got three. <laughs> no, but some of those are in parentheses. No, no. <laughs> Conditional oh, no, so we got points. two points for that one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's I three points for Ben and Hedvig, four points for Jessica and Rosie, and six points for Chelsea and Audrey. Oh, snap. Mm -hmm. Half as many, Ben and Hedvig. <laughs> Henry, take Ouch. us to number four. Okay, question four. The IOL has been held three times in Bulgaria, making it the country that has hosted the contest most frequently. Which of these languages is Bulgarian most closely related to? Closely related to in the sense that English is more closely related to German than French because the split in the family tree um, between English and German happened more recently than English, German versus French. Okay. And okay. the answers? A, Macedonian. B, Greek. C, Romanian. Which of these languages is Bulgarian most closely related to Macedonian, Greek, or Romanian? Drop into chat. Make your choice. Hey, come on. Now, this is where the doctor in front of your name. It's Macedonian. Okay. Okay. I know it is. It's okay. a southeast Slavic language. Greek is in Slavic and Albanian is in Slavic. Uh, he didn't say Albanian. He said uh, Romanian. Romanian, oh, Romanian okay. is Romance. Oh, okay. It's related to French and Romani and stuff. Okay. It's Macedonian. I'm sorry. I, I think it's a nope. better chit chat to have. Um, um, I was recently actually perusing the Indo-European tree um, oh, for please, funsies. When we come back, can you please say that in exactly that way and delivery <laughs> and tone of voice? I was recently perusing the Indo-European family tree for funsies. Because I, I remember thinking that because it's like Serbian, Slovenian, Croatian, you know, they're Slavic. In Macedonia, you could be you could think that it's related to Greek. I would have assumed it was, yeah. It's not. I'm pretty pretty sure. When you're ready. We are ready, Daniel. And Hedvig okay. has a delightful anecdote to share when she gives the answer. <laughs> Let's begin with the better Dorothy and Toto. What you got? Which one's most closely related to Bulgarian? This was kind of my call just because we were kind of um, guessing here, but I think because South Slavic languages, so I th I'm thinking Macedonian. Okay, we have a guest from Macedonian. Elder Millennials? Oh, uh, yes, that's us. <laughs> I almost forgot our name. See, I can't remember stuff. I'm, I'm a useless <laughs> contestant. There's, I can. I was going to say I can cheat as much as I like, but I'm not going to cheat. Uh, we also think it's Macedonian. Uh, I was perusing the Indo-European tree recently, and I was looking at Bulgarian, and I'm pretty sure Macedonian was not far from it. Okay, and now we head over to Latvian Winnie the Pooh. Um, okay, so our sense of geography is pretty ter terrible. So this was a complete guess here, going off pure in instinct. 
And we said Romania. Hmm. That's going to give you some points if you're right, Henry. Well, I'm glad that Jessica actually gave even a like a name of a branch. This was absolutely correct. The correct answer is Macedonian. Yes. Very good. Evening up these scores. I like it. It's anyone's game. Mm-hmm. Yes. We're nipping at their heels, folks. We're going to take them down. Five, six, and six. Last question for this round. So for question five, the team problem at the 2019 contest held in Yongin in South Korea was about the scoring system in the sport of rhythmic gymnastics. But how many rhythmic gymnasts representing Australia are in Tokyo at the moment competing in the Olympic Games? And what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? And for this, for this question, everyone will guess a number and the person who has the closest will win. Just weird question. I have recently learned that in the Olympics you have like replacement. So like the entire troop. Uh, yes. Including replacements. Okay. All right. Off you go. I said that like that was really smart, but I actually, that doesn't bring me any more knowledge. <laughs> I'm going to say, so Australia spends a disgusting amount of money on their sporting programs, this we know, right? So I think mm. the number is going to be relatively high, um, but I don't know what relatively high is. 20. Because like in the group gymnastics, there's like five or six of them on stage. I'm, I'm thinking this group for rhythmic gymnastics as opposed to the other kind. I'm going to say 20 to 30, including replacements. My guess was also 20, so let's, shall we say 25? Okay, split the difference. Yeah. Elder millennials are ready. Lavia and Winnie the Pooh, your answer, please. Okay, so we weren't exactly sure how many would actually be there because I, I watched it yesterday. It seems like there were only like four people, but there are different types of gymnastics. So um, we're going to go 10, just as an even number. Gotcha. Okay, uh, better Dorothy and Toto. Um, so sometime a few weeks ago, I was watching a random gymnastics video and like there were like four-ish on the main team and there are a few others who were just there. So, okay, cool. Just is just having last minute panic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um we're going to go 11 because oh. we're like that. Okay. 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 Very good. Uh, They're gaming the system. We may well have erred here. Um, I, our logic was Australia, Australia spends a disgusting amount of money on our sporting program, so it's going to be like way higher than you would think it is, and we went with 25. Okay. <laughs> Henry, who got it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The people who actually watched this event will have a distinct advantage, obviously. Um, but the correct answer is six. No! So. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh no. A Latvian Winnie the Pooh, although off brand children's entertainment, is destroying the competition. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of round two, we have Ben and Hedwig, the elder millennials, at five. We've got Jessica and Rosie, the better Dorothy and Toto, on six. And Chelsea and Audrey, Latvian Winnie the Pooh, on eight. Still in the lead. Uh, Elizabeth and Victoria, how do you think you'd be doing on this? I definitely have a few guesses in there. <laughs> but um, Guesses. Yes, I got this last one right. I did. I actually thought I thought six for the last one, though, randomly. So, oh, yeah, popped yeah. into your head. Me too. Wow, oh. you should be a team. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, let's move on to round three. Henry, take us in. Okay, so round three, we're back in the realm of linguistics firmly. Um, and I've called this generational talking for, oh, uh, no. uh, and, you know, named after an undescribed uh, TV program, uh, which is about, you know, the different generations contesting their knowledge. Uh, and this round will involve a list of four words and all had their first use recorded in print in the same decade, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. And you have to guess the correct decade for three points this time. Oh, okay. And just okay. as an example... So the four words, dead name, twerking, neurodivergence, and the verb to zoom all appeared in the 2010s for the first time. Right. Gotcha. That's yeah. how the game works. Okay. All right. Let's so go. The, the first question, radio gene, uh, as in the uh, biological gene. Uh, not the pants. Not the pants. Not yep. the singular gene. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. So, so radio gene racism and the courtesy title Ms. So M-S. And it's multiple choice. Um, so is it A, the 1880s, B, the 1900s, or C, the 1920s? Radio, gene, racism, and Ms. Was it the 1880s, 1900s, or 1920s? Drop into chat. Make your choice. So, Ben, mm -hmm. Marie Curie got the Nobel Prize twice for radioactivity in mm -hmm. the 1920s. Radio is older than that, though. So, exactly. That's, that's my saying. So, it can't be 1920s. Okay. Okay. Good. We're on the same page then. So, I don't know. I'm feeling 1880s. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit torn on this one as well. Gene is throwing me a little bit as well because I feel like that might be later. I don't know. Genes. When did we figure out genes? Because genes are so tiny. 1880s is when my my microscopy, my microscopy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're ready. Great. We're also ready. Love you, Winnie the Pooh. Did these words appear in the 1880s, 1900s, or 1920s? Um, so we're just going to go the 1880s because we think that's around where the radio was invented and when like, maybe feminism might have started coming in. So, okay. yeah, that's our reasoning. Sounds good. Dorothy and Toto. Um, yeah, we were also thinking about when the radio was invented and like light waves and physics homework has really drilled it into me but um the radio was invented in 1895 so i'm pretty sure it would have appeared after the oh. 1880s so it would have been 1900s okay and the elder millennials pesky youngsters with their homework and knowledge is it your turn <laughs> hedvig i think it is well we also guessed 1880 um just because we felt like it, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Our yeah. reasoning wasn't that good. We we really got like old old people on the question. I feel it in my bones. It's the eighteen eighties yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought I thought it's got to be long before Marie Curie. That was the only thought I had. <laughs> okay, Henry. Right. Well, you can't argue with the science, and Jessica's is exactly right when the radio was invented. And so the answer is the 1900s. Oh, well done. Nicely done, team. The 1990s. <laughs> I can't believe you remembered that date. Oh. <laughs> Physics really drilled it into me, Choi, okay? I just, I just have this image of like a really stern physics teacher and being like, every single one of you will remember this day as a day that lives in infamy. Henry. So question two, the acronym TV, role model, DJ, again the acronym, and the word acronym itself, hmm. was it oh, wow. the 1920s, the 1930s, or the 1940s? TV, role model, DJ, or acronym, was it the 20s, 30s, or 40s? TVs aren't really kicking around until the 40s, right? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Television, TV, mm, uh, DJ. Also, I want to just make a point. Uh, 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 when it comes to two-letter abbreviations, are they initialisms or acronyms? Because acronyms are the ones that you say as a word, right? Like NASA or whatever. Yeah. Initialisms can be pronounced... Um, like the OECD is an initialism, not an acronym. Yes, and it should be the initials. Well, it's usually well, there are technically abbreviations that don't have the initials, like Oslo as yeah, an yeah, O yeah. and a Z, yeah, which yeah. isn't really me. Um, so we're going with the forties. But anyway, for this feature, uh, uh, number forty, forties. Uh, okay. Is that what we say? We are ready. Okay. okay, let's start with the better Dorothy and Toto. When did we see these words for the first time? Um, so we picked the nineteen thirties, just okay. purely based off. Feelings, I guess. Mm. <laughs> Random guess. <laughs> They're never wrong. Elder Millennials. We went with the 40s this time around, um, mm -hmm. thinking that TV in particular is fairly recent, and especially its like initialization might have been even a little bit lagging after the original sort of invention. Lavi and Winnie the Pooh. Um, we went 30s um, mainly because we thought the 20s was a bit early and because, you know, going the middle is always 
a good option. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Henry. Come on, Henry. Do it for me, mate. There is a correct answer amongst us. And it's actually Hedwig and Ben. It was the 1940s. <gasps> yes! Yes! And that's yes. three points, am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Three that's three. Big old yes. points. I like this system with points for the rounds. Like yeah, third yeah, yeah. round, three points. Hmm. Can I ask a linguistics question of everyone in the room? Um, is TV and DJ an acronym or an initialism? Or both? I would call them initialisms. The acronyms uh, are uh, when the uh, initials spell out a word. Right, like NASA or whatever, something yeah. like that. But have we gotten to the point now TV. where it is like T-E-E-V-E-E -E 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 in some instances yeah. and at that mm. point does it become... Uh, an acronym as well as initials. Yeah, I guess if it's written out in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Swedish you've read it out T E V E. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess that's like okay, O K A Y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? And it's only the two letter ones that seem to like get that special nether region treatment. Yes. And interestingly, I've seen fewer and fewer people care about the difference between initialism and acronym. It doesn't seem to matter to too many people anymore, except for clever people who ring me up on Thursday mornings on the ABC. <laughs> and your co-host, Ben. Yeah, yes. A preference, uh, preference between LOL and, LOL and LOL. Oh, <laughs> That's a yeah. good rule, Victoria. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Difference between LOL and yeah. LOL. Who says LOL? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, question three. The words are robot. Recycle, totalitarian, and penicillin. Ooh. Is it the 1910s, the 1920s, or the 1930s? Okay, robot, recycle, totalitarian, penicillin. Was it the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s? Make your choice. I think it's old, and I know robot is from robota in Slavic languages, which means to work, but that doesn't really help you. I know robot's pretty old. I think penicillin is your old. is your marker here, right? Like when did we? Because yeah. we did not have antibiotics widely available in World War One, correct? Oh wow, that's impressive knowledge. So you're thinking 1920s? I think so. I feel like yeah that we didn't have that we didn't have broad antibiotic available. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's going to be my guess. I feel like we also had words instead of robot earlier than robot. Like we probably had automaton was a word that we had earlier yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, so, oh, what's it called? Um, <laughs> I don't know, but I like that no one else can hear you right now. <laughs> something, something Turk. Oh, mechanical Turk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we probably shouldn't say because I feel like that's probably bad now. Probably is. Okay, I think we're ready, Daniel. We are taking this one first to Latvia and Winnie the Pooh. So our reasoning behind this was regarding penicillin. I think mm -hmm. it was um, discovered, I think, at the end of the 1920s or something around there. So if the word origin was a bit later than that, I'm guessing 1930s. So that's our reasoning. Okay, 1930s. And let's go with better Dorothy and Toto. Actually, that was the same reasoning as well. Um, we are thinking penicillin was around 1930s. These people know stuff. Ooh, this is interesting, yeah, though. Scary. Elder millennials. We were thinking 1920s for like mm -hmm. similar reasons, um, but just that we thought penicillin was invented earlier. Okay, Henry. Right. Well, Hedwig and Ben are correct. Yes. It's the 1920s. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh, I feel so good about this. I felt so smart when I was like, hey, Hedvig, I don't think uh, penicillin was broadly available in World War I, but I don't think it was as late yeah. as the 1930s. Yeah! Oh, I feel so clever right now. It's so good. You are terribly clever. And now let's go to question four. <laughs> question four. The words are the adjective linguistic, the word restaurant, sodium, and the verb signal. Can I ask a clarifying question, Henry? Please. Because you pronounced restaurant in a French accent just then. Did I? Yeah, what was that all about? Do you mean restaurant in usage in French or in English usage? No, this is English. Okay. This is, just, yeah. just clarifying. Just clarifying. Linguistic. The adjective. Restaurant. There. 
sodium and the verb to signal. Yes, oh, have you read the you haven't read the years yet? Yeah. So the options are the 1800s, the 1850s, or the 1900s. Oh, nice widespread there for linguistic, restaurant, sodium, and the verb to signal. 1800s, 1850s, or 1900s. Which one is it? Make the call. I feel like we can say conclusively have... it's not the 1900s. Yes. That's too late. That's too I agree. Late. Um, sodium. Sodium feels like so many alchemists kicking around the 1800s. Hey? Yeah, that's they what I was thinking. Sodium seems like sodium. old, right? Sodium seems like one of those yeah. fundamental ones that they would have discovered super early on. Restaurants, for the longest time in human history, it was not a they thing. weren't restaurants, yeah, right? No. You like, would go to an inn or something, right? If you are a rest- rich person, you'd just get food cooked for you at home. Yeah, 100%. Period. Um, so are you thinking 1850s then? I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Maybe 1800s. What was the other words? Hang on. Like, Linguistic. Let's think about like the era of the French Enlightenment and that sort of thing. That was the eight, late 18th century, early 19th century, right? When people were like sitting at cafes and discussing philosophy and all that. Was, does that mean restaurants would have been around at roughly the same time? Yeah, I would guess so. So we we'll want to go 1800s? Say 1800. Okay. Let's go 1800s. Okay. Yeah. When you're ready, let's bring it back. Hedvig, you explain the reasoning on this one. We're done. Okay. I think everyone's done. Okay, great. Uh, so <laughs> let's start with the elder millennials. Well, we were thinking the 1800s, and we were thinking mm-hmm. that it's like the Enlightenment era, and everyone's sitting outside a cafe is talking about the meaning of life and morality. And sodium. Very good. Lavi and Winnie the Pooh? So similar with Jess. This is physics reasoning earlier. We um, are kind of less educated than Jess, but we know that the periodic table was somewhere in between 1850 and 1900. So we're just going to go to the 1850s. Ooh. Okay, very good. Very good. And better Dorothy and Toto. We were also thinking 1850s, but for significantly less smart reasons. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> we were just like, you know, restaurant... What other word would you use for restaurant? Like food shop? <laughs> so, Ye so olde we food really, shop. yeah. I was just trying to squeeze something out, but it, nothing came out. Eating house. Eating house. <laughs> In. Food hall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got legs, that term. All right. So, so what would your guess? Oh, yeah. The, 18, oh, same guess. 1850s. 1850s, yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, this okay. could this could be us like made in the shade here, Hedvig, if we get this one right and those two get it wrong mm, again. Yeah. Mm. Henry? Well again, there is the correct answer. Uh, amongst the three it's, teams. He said A. He said A. It's a singular answer. <laughs> <laughs> no. <It's, laughs> the answer away, is uh, the eighteen hundreds. Yes! <laughs> oh, Ben, we are so much better at this round than any other round. I don't know what that says about us. Thousand angels right now. Oh, this is so good. I like the reasoning about the periodic table, but you have to remember that a lot of the elements were discovered before the periodic table was invented. This was actually a thing that Hedvig and I um, discussed. We were like, we reckon that like kooky, sort of like um, polymath type weird people without their like eyebrows had found sodium like fairly early on in the process. Well, this means that at the end of round three, Lavi and Winnie the Pooh is on eight points, the better Dorothy and Toto was on nine, and the elder millennials, Ben and Hedvig, have rocketed to the top at 14 points. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's that just, round. Yes. Hey. It's still anybody's game, though. And remember, this round, our final round, is a heavy hitter. There's a lot of points here. So mm. don't get too comfy. They like to tease us on TikTok, but us old-timey, not-old, semi-old people are holding our own. I like how we're in our 30s and we're like, we're old. Because do you know how many times I get called boomer by teenagers, Hedvig? It happens to me at least three times a week. (laughs) Wow, but you're not even Generation X. I know, there is an entire generation between my generation and the boomer generation, and still, to a teenage eyes, a lot of the time they're just like, you're okay, boomer, shut up. Don't worry, we're used to getting wow. ignored. <laughs> Are you technically boomer? No, you're not, Daniel. You're no, a generation I'm a, X. I'm, a, I'm an early I'm an early X. An uh, elder I'm an old X. Xer. An elder Xer. All right. This is our final round. Henry, take us in. Right. So this round, round four, the last round, is called Not in the Family. 
And so the last round, we looked at when words uh, came into English. And now we're going to look at where words come from in English. Fun! Oh, this is so good. So what we're going to do is try to guess the language of ultimate origin for a bunch of English loan words. And ultimate origin as in, you know, as far back as we can go. Proto-Indo-European. Um, I win. We're done. Let's go. Actually, I don't <laughs> know if this will be a hint, but n- these languages are not Indo-European. And so that's oh, why the, the round okay. is called not in the family. That's, uh, okay. yeah. that's good. That's good. I like that. It's a bit of an interesting structure. So, okay. So how this is going to work is that there'll be four words and I'm going to give them to you one at a time as hints. And you get more points, the fewer hints you get. So if you can guess it from the first word straight away, you get a whole bunch of points. And we knock ourselves out if we guess, I assume. Yes, exactly. And so okay. this is going to require a bit of trust. So you're going to have to, uh, at each word, um, I guess Daniel will ask who would want to, you know. Yep. Submit yep. Lock in. Um, and you can't change after you. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> now let's deal with the scoring here. The scoring is if you manage to nail it on the first clue, you get 10 points. 10? Ten. Good God. Ten. Because it's hard. If you need two to do it, you drop down to five points. If you need that third clue, you drop down to two. And if you get all four clues, then it's one point. But one point is still a point. Wow. So there's a bit of risk, but a bit of reward. That's a slope. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a bonanza round. (laughs) Okay, so this is question one. Henry, will you please give us the first word from this language? Okay, so the first word is the word zero. Now, what you got to do is drop into chat, see if you want to guess after just hearing only this word or decide if you're going to roll it over. Hedvig. Oh, my God. Wait, so I was just wondering, can you only guess once per per question? Yes. If you decide to guess after the first word, then that was your guess. You don't get to guess again. And they're all, all the words are from the same language. Yes. Correct for this question. Okay. Drop into chat. Decide if you think you know it, how confident you are, and are you going to take your shot after this one clue? I feel unsure. I know that I'm pretty sure English got the concept of zero from Arabic uh, uh, algebra and stuff. Yeah, from the golden the golden age of Arabic enlightenment. But I don't know if we got the word zero. Like, mm. So, uh, uh, no, Arabic is not remember, European, so that's... Yeah, so that's what that's exactly what I was about to say. Like, so we're in at least the right... We haven't immediately gone to an Indo-European language, so that's a good start. I'm not encouraging gambling, but if you are behind, this is a good chance to pick up points. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> do we want to Do we want to just try and cement our win right now with one big, bold move? Why don't we play a little bit okay. more okay. cautiously? I don't think we should lock in now. Okay, I'm writing. I'm writing ours down, and if we've cost ourselves ten points, because I reckon we should say like proto-Semitic. Oh no, I think Henry's going to mean Arabic broadly if it is Arabic. Okay, please don't tell me what you think the language is. All I want to know is if you want to take your shot after hearing this one clue. But don't tell me what you think the language is. Does anybody want to take their shot and commit to an answer now? We don't want to. We don't know. Okay. Um, any other teams? I think Chelsea and I are going to do it. Oh! Okay, okay. This is bold. This is bold. If you don't mind, since you got nothing else to do for this round, uh, send me what you think the answer is in chat. Only to me, not to all the teams. And can I ask a clarifying question of Henry? Yes. Basically, are we looking to go as far sort of back in time along the linguistic family tree to find the original precursor language or are we just looking for the actual extant language where this word came from an extant language okay so cool. not like proto proto whatever whatever yeah, yeah okay okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. okay well since we have one team committing let's go on to our next clue henry if you please okay so the second clue and if you get it you're gonna have five points is the word alcove so if for those who don't know an alcove is like a recessed part of a wall in 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 a room Feel like that makes me think Arabic. Yeah, that's exactly. Do do we do we want to do we want to commit, Hedvig? I think so. I'm I reckon sure. Audrey and Chelsea have got it right as well. By the way, I reckon they guessed Arabic for the same reason we did. Mm. Okay. Do we or do you want to do you want to do you want to be cautious? N- no. Um. 
If I'm going to play fair, then I think it's what we said. We are ready. Okay. All right. Is there anybody who wants to commit to, after hearing these two clues, yes. taking your shot? We will. We do. Okay. Very good. Would you please send me in chat what you think the language is? But don't, of course, say it out loud. We're majorly regretting committing right now, but, you know, we are <laughs> <laughs> it's a good gamble. Okay, now it's time for our third clue, and this one is only for the better Dorothy and Toto, for Jessica and Rosie. Yeah, so the third clue is the word alcohol. Do we regret our decision now? No. No? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Alcohol, alcohol, algorithm, algebra. I think we've got it. Do we just say it out loud now, or do we still text it? No, why don't you go ahead and say it? The other teams have texted to me. Or messaged. We were just debating. This was all over the place. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure it's Arabic, just based off the last word, alcohol. I think it's Arabic. Mm-hmm. What, what, do you, what do you know about that one? Is that well, one that you, you've heard that one before? Yeah. I've, I've probably heard it somewhere in a like fun fact sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Ben and Hedvig also said Arabic and... Chelsea and Audrey also said Arabic. Oh, Henry. no. Oh, no. Wow. Well, oh, no. You know, they took a risk and it paid off. Oh. Everyone was right. It is Arabic. Hey, <laughs> big. <laughs> so I so, so much. <laughs> no. Oh, very exciting. So just to give a rundown of where, what these words come from. Uh, what was algebra. the last word, by the way? Can we ask what the last word was going to be? It was, it was algebra. algebra. Okay. Um, yeah. And are all those, is that true that they're all like alcohol, algebra, alcove, al is like an article or something? Yes. So many words have been borrowed from Arabic with the definite article al, which means the, basically. Um, and so uh, algebra, um, alcohol, alcove. Um, and the word zero um, is from the word sifr, which means uh, empty. And it's interestingly, it's actually a semantic loan from Sanskrit, shunya, because the medieval Arab world got the idea of zero notation from India. So shunya in, in Sanskrit means empty. No way. It? I actually said India as the first. <laughs> I, I thought zero came from India. <laughs> we, nice. just, we just thought that, you know, the Arabic seem kind of smart and they're very old. So <laughs> that's basically it. <laughs> Oh, I'm regretting not rolling the dice. My favorite Arabic al word is for the fruit that they had called al birkuk, and it worked its way into English apricot, which means that the beer turned into a pre, and that's another example of R metathesis, where the R changes places, just like with mascarpone and comfortable. Comfortable, sorry. Yeah. All right, good job, good job. Score check, score was... check. How, how, much, how much did that pull them into line? Okay, so better Dorothy and Toto's on 11, Ben and Hedwig on 19, and Latvia and Winnie the Pooh, 18 big, big points. Okay, it's time for what I think is going to be our final question. The format is the same. Henry, let us in here. Right, so the first clue is the word agar. So that's the stuff that, you know, they put on um, Petri dishes. Um, it's made of algae, agar, A-G-A-R. Mm -hmm. How confident are you that you know what language this is? Drop into chat, make your decision, and then let me know if you're ready to commit. Mm. I do not feel confident out of the gate the way I did with zero. No, no, me neither. I was, I was going to say like Korean. They're mad for seaweed. I feel, no, I feel like uh, this is like Greek or something. This feels like a Greeky kind of word. I think none of them are Indo-European oh. and Greek is Indo-European. Sorry. Korean, We're not yeah. confident enough to look in. It's, it does not sound um, Japanese. Also, Korean, I don't think, are loving the R at the end. Agar. Yeah, true. Well, it could have been agar and English yeah, added true. the R. Yeah, true. I'm not sure. I don't think we should lock in. No, no, I'm not confident. Okay. We are not confident and not locking and answering. Very good. Then the other team is ready to commit. I think Chelsea and I are going to commit again. Ah. Oh, oh wow. my gosh. Wow. Okay, Audrey gamblers. and Chelsea, Latvian and Winnie the Pooh. We also committed. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. 
Okay. Wow. What do they know that we don't know? Oh, this could go all kinds of ways. All right. In that case, would you please send me your answer in chat? And Ben and Hedvig, get ready for your next clue. Okay. So the next clue is the word cockatoo. The bird. Cockatoo. Uh, what? Ben, go to mute. Da, da, what? Da, da. Agar and cockatoo from the same language? How is that? Gee, Willikers, Hedvig, I don't know what this could possibly be. <laughs> Too late, Audrey. <laughs> um, um, sorry, I meant to send that to Chelsea. <laughs> you definitely tried to change, didn't you? <laughs> um, Geez, um, I, I can't, I cannot. Um, if it makes you feel any better, Audrey, we're also freaking out over here. <laughs> yeah, kind of did like a complete 360 right before he... Um, <laughs> yeah, we just sent it and we're like, oh, I think it's the other one. <laughs> what about Ty? I'm just saying. Ty. Why do I feel nervous? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of tense up a little bit. Like, but is there cockatoos anywhere but Australia? I know, I'm confused as well. But the, the word could still come from somewhere else. No, not really. Malay? But I saw her mouth the word. Indonesian? Yeah, like one of, like, Bahasa something. Oh, uh, I'm still not feeling confident on this, to be honest. No, me neither. No, okay. I want another one. Um, we politely think that Henry is a monster for putting the word cockatoo after the word agar and have no idea and would like a third clue, please. Are you ready to commit? Negative. No, no not at all. all we, right. are le- we are less ready to commit after the second <laughs> yeah, word than we would we have been at the first. We were more sure at the first one. Yeah. Right. Well, the third one is actually also sort of animal Evil. themed. And it's the animal pangolin, the pangolin. Okay. Okay. Don't forget to mute yourself first, Hedwig. You can go ahead and discuss openly because they other the other teams have sent me their answer. Okay. Well, I mean, so should pa- we do that? Should we just pangolin a thing in Indonesia? The pangolin, is it? I thought it was in South America. South uh, Oh. Hang on. Hang on. Should we have should we have a discussion so that everyone can should laugh I at catch. us? I've unmuted myself. Okay, all right. We're going to have a discussion in general. We're really, really confused. We were like, maybe it's like some sort of Bahasa, like Indonesian Malay. And then we're like, maybe it's Korean. Now we're like somewhere in South America. We're really all over the place. Yeah. Um, I, I could have sworn the pangolin was a South American animal and the cockatoo is like an Australian animal. And, <laughs> and I thought pangolins were a thing in S- South Africa. So we're 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 really doing we just need something for Europe and um and North America and then we've done all continents. Yeah. Uh, I really just thought the cockatoo was supposed to be imitative like all birds. Um okay. I I don't know. I I still ah uh, like I mean I could take a guess but it, that's all it would be at this point. I have no idea. But if you think South America then it's going to be like Quechua, one of the Quechuas. But that's where we get like the, the chocolate and those things. Not, not, mm. no, no, no. You, uh, and if you think it's. It's also worth remembering, Hedvig, and this does happen decade to decade every now and then. I could be wrong about where the pangolin comes from. Where there are pangolins and also people who are really into seaweed. That's my hard. <laughs> there are a lot of weird animals in Wallacea in Indonesia. So if we say Bahasa, then we cover like 30 different languages. What do you think? Hey, no fair. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. I think we need the final clue, to be honest. Even if it gets yeah, us one I point. Think so too. It's a language whose name means language. Okay. Aww. What's our last? No, just kidding. Uh, what's our last clue? So the last clue, um, probably the one that everyone you know is looking for, is another animal, and it's the orangutan. Uh... Oh. Okay. Then it is um, some sort of Indonesian Malay. One of them, because it means orang means person and utan means forest. It's yeah. people from the forest, um, and it's but God there's knows a, there's which a lot one of languages. Of all the things. That's a lot of languages there. Let's just say Indonesian and hope that he gives it to us. Okay, that even that, though that's that, also really broad. Yeah, that thing that okay. was created in like the late. Yeah, Indonesian, sure. Yeah, let's say Indonesian. Okay. And I, if, we get, if it's Malay, I want half a point at least, or one point. Uh, Henry, would we say that that Malay and Indonesian are equivalent terms? Whether this is right or wrong, can we say that they're equivalent? Would you give the same point to both? Uh, 
hypothetically, yes, I would. Yeah. I would. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That doesn't sound promising at all. <laughs> okay. Let's treat it as equivalent. So, you've all functionally guessed the same answer. Oh. Because both Lavi and Winnie the Pooh and the better Dorothy and Toto have said Malay and oh. immediately regretted their decision. Hmm. Oh, I really hope we're all wrong. We, I really hope we're all wrong. That means that if you're all correct, if you're all wrong, then it's Elder Millennials on 19, Lavi and Winnie the Pooh on 18, and the better Dorothy and Toto on 11. But if you all got it right, then, well, it's Lavi and Winnie the Pooh in first place on 28. It's the better Dorothy and Toto in second place on 21, and Ben and Hevigan last place, the Elder Millennials, on 20. This depends oh, on no. whether you got it right or wrong. Oh, Henry, no. did they get it right? Let me just say, I am very, very impressed by the, you know, the goal to guess. The audacity. On Ego. Me so too. For that alone, congratulations. And I can say that the correct answer is indeed Malay. So all of you. Amazing. We went from first oh, place God. to last place. <laughs> Literally, my only logic was that agar agar is in a lot of Malaysian desserts. Because <laughs> agar yeah, agar, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Agar agar um, is Malaysian. So I was like, yeah. I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, <laughs> I was just relying on Audrey's extensive watching of MasterChef to get us through this. <laughs> and I'm happy to say it did. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> what a game changer. <laughs> so Ben and Hedvig, the elder millennials, Strolling into last place on 20, we've got the better Dorothy and Toto in second place on 21, and props to Latvian Winnie the Pooh taking the game at 20. Hey, big points, big ups for all of you. Thank bravo. you for playing. Bravo, bravo. How does it feel? The, the boldness to guess so early in both times, I'm very impressed yeah, uh, with, with your knowledge. But most <laughs> most of all, I'm impressed with the, the pure goal, like the... <laughs> What's the call? Is that the same as Schutzpa? Like the, yeah, the, yeah. the bravery. It it's very yeah. impressive. It, look, I've been told explicitly I wasn't allowed to swear in this, but mm -hmm. if I was right now, that I have some <laughs> choice words about these <laughs> individuals right here and what they were willing to just put on the line. It's good we're in an Australian show. Honestly, I watched The Chase like so many nights. And every time I just want the contestant to take the top offer and they never do. So, you know what? This is just my equivalent. Just take the gamble yeah, yeah, and yeah. go big. And you did so well of it. Chelsea and Audrey, congratulations on your win. Jessica and Rosie, congratulations as well. That was thrilling. I'm sitting down, but that was Amazing. like I'm worked up a sweat. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know who really won today? Science. Oh, boo. <laughs> Boo, boo no. you and your like generalist. No. As no. losers, I can say that forget about science. I wanted to win. Was was the yeah. uh, was the real prize the friends we made along the way? No. No, no. the real prize is no. winning, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. And you didn't. But Audrey Choi, Chelsea Hin, Jessica Lee, and Rosie Nguyen, thank you so much for, for playing with us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. It was really fun, yeah. Yeah. That's really exciting. And Victoria Papoyano and Dr. Elizabeth Meyer, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Same here. Elizabeth, if there's a linguistically minded teacher or person or just listener who wants to help with Ozclo, Naclo, or the other linguistic Olympiads along mm -hmm. the way, you've mentioned that there are games that they can play on the yep. website, and we'll have a link to that on our, on our blog, becauselanguage.com. Mm -hmm. What else could someone do if they wanted to help the cause? They could simply stare every young person they know towards the web page, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that would be a really good idea. Just, you know, make it known around, include all their friends and everyone, but specifically the young people. That would be really good because I think they would love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it happens all too often that people only discover the Linguistic Olympiad when they're in their senior year or or even some people like me, only when they finished high school. I never got to compete in the Olympiad because no one told me about it while I was in high school. So right. tell a friend about it. And uh, this goes actually for all of our international listeners as well, because there are national Olympiads all over the globe. There's probably one in the country you're listening in. So uh, tell them that linguistic Olympiads are a thing and that they should go look their local one up. Henry, thank you so much for being such a great quiz master and writing such fiendishly devious questions. I <laughs> immensely enjoyed 
trying to, you know, create the most complex and, you know, interesting li- language ten- tangential, let's say, questions. Oh, that's <laughs> language adjacent. Yeah, that's I love that. <laughs> and Ben and Hedvig, thanks. Thanks for playing. There's always next year. Our pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, you guys. GG. F this, F you, F everyone. That's all I have to say without swearing. <laughs> Good quiz, though. I really enjoyed those questions. That was heaps of fun. I thought um, all those teams did such great work, especially right at the end there where they destroyed us. I, I... Oh. Yeah, I was very impressed by the, the narrative of it all. The teams went from very few points to very many points. I think Henry designed a very fun, exciting quiz. Absolutely. All the hallmarks of a really good board game, right? A dynamic yeah. game mm. where the lead can change at any moment based on yes. how well people perform. Of course, I hate it because it changed on me from winning <laughs> to losing, but other than that, yeah, great. Just great. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, it was awesome. But now it's time for Word of the Week. And Hedvig, I think you've got the first word. Yes, I have the first word of the week. It is Teflon Kandidaten. Hmm. Teflon Candidate. Yes, exactly. Yes. I think I know what this is. Do you? What do you? It, so this word comes to us from German, but it also occurs in Swedish as Teflon polit- Politiker. Hmm. So what do you think it means? Well, if I've been hearing about this for a really long time, but Ben, you've you've got this right. You're across. I I don't know. Do you know the funniest thing is the way I um I relate to this word is that there was a person whom I worked with once upon a time, who famously other people would describe as like a Teflon employee, meaning no Mm -hmm. matter how sort of like mediocrely this particular individual performed, just nothing stuck and they just always seemed to Mm -hmm. just sort of keep on trucking. Um, So that's what – and then I heard the word candidate, so I was like, oh, okay, like that, but for a politician. But what is this doing in German? Well, in German, particularly right now, there's an election going on, uh, and the CDU, so the Christian Democratic Party, uh, which is the biggest party here in Germany, um, their candidate for a uh, chancellor position, Armin Laschet, uh, has for a long time been called the Teflon candidate because whatever scandals and whatever missteps he does doesn't seem to stick to him. However, recently, things seem to be sticking more. So he's been in the news as the Teflon candidate who's sort of no longer a Teflon candidate. And it has the same use in Swedish, except we just say Teflon politicians. I think you can you can compound it with whatever you like. Uh, Teflon employee sounds reasonable as well. But hmm. yeah, it's been, I've seen it a lot in the German news this week. Well, well. Sorry, Hedvig, did you just say that the Christian Democratic Party is the biggest party in Germany? Yes. Really? Wow. Yes. Are they terrible? Well, Angela Merkel is, is their chancellor. Mm-hmm. Um, they... Right, so European politics, Christian Democrats. Um, but hang on, so there's a guy who's there's a guy who's like um, competing internally against Merkel, or is she just stepping down? Merkel is resigning. Okay, fair enough. Ah, uh, I'll bring you European news. Uh, okay. Angela Merkel is resigning as Chancellor of uh, Germany, uh, and there is currently an election going on. And yeah, the Christian Democrats is the largest party. There's also CSU, which is the Christian Democrats, but only in Bavaria. They have a mutually exclusive agreement that the National Party will not campaign in Bavaria. And um, the Bavarian Party will not campaign outside of Bavaria. It's very strange. They're in a weird union. There's lots of other parties going on. Christian Democrats in non... Like, this is a... Christian Democrats is a thing that exists in Europe minus UK, uh, like we have them in Sweden, they have them in France. They're they're a thing. Are they the centrist left party? They're centrist right, I would say. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Well, the term Teflon president first appeared in English in 1983 because Democratic Congresswoman Patricia Schrader of Colorado sort of coined it. Reagan was a terrible but popular president and nothing, it's not really true that nothing stuck to him. His popularity did go up and down with the unemployment rate and then it really cratered after Iran-Contra. So things really did stick to him. But he had this aura of invincibility and when things failed to go badly for him, Democrats really hated that. So he got the name Teflon President. Next word. This one was suggested by Rianne on Discord. I'll just read this. This is from the BBC. A record number of people who've come into contact with an infected person are self-isolating, most of them having been pinged by the National Health Uh, Service's contact tracing app. It's called a ping-demic. Ping-demic. I like it. 
also been spotted in Swedish publications, at least. That's what I heard. Hedvig, have you seen this around? No, I haven't, but I use Ping. I've noticed online that I use Ping a lot more than other people. Like, if there's something on Twitter or Facebook and I want to tag someone, I'll go Ping Ben, ben Ainsley. I do that too. I'll write the words ping. Like I'll send yeah. that as the only word in a text if I'm trying to get someone's reaction and they haven't responded Yeah. quickly. And it comes from the term, um, like how you measure speed in networks. You say ping time, right? Because you right. send a message and then ping and then you get pong back. Well, hang Ideally. on. Uh, don't we need to go a bit further back in the etymological chain though? Because that's not where it originated, right? It was um, sub submariners who used it first, weren't they? Oh, let's check that. Don't know. Yeah, so I I believe that the networking terminology was borrowed uh, from the navy because in submarines, oh, when enough. you want to um, sort of locate uh, enemy adversaries, you send <gasps> out a echolocation <gasps> ping, and you literally listen for the. I was watching Das Boot. Uh, oh, so in good. In the last few months, so, so good. Oh. the yeah. series, the series, or the original. Dear old movie. Oh, yeah. man, what a Terrifying. film. Terrifying. Yeah, what a film. Well, it looks like the the meaning that Ben is referring to dates from about 1943, but according to Etym Online, the online etymology dictionary, it originally, in 1835, referred to the sound of a bullet whistling through the air or striking something sharply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I guess, yeah, it was like in submariner terms, you would hear the ping and we and they called it a ping because it's onomatopoeic right like just like ping was for like bullets in the 1800s um so i think the networking guys deliberately sort of knowingly borrowed it from submariners and submariners just used it because that's the word we used for the sound of something going ping our friend zaprithi on discord comments not gonna lie ngl i kind of hate it as a word it's just trying to shift the blame for everyone needing to self-isolate onto the app for pinging people instead of recognizing the fact that it's pinging people because everyone's catching COVID. Yeah. But yeah. hey, interesting new word, at least, lol. Yeah. That's, I agree. That's, that's good. I agree. Finally, HODL. HODL? Yes, HODL gang, HODL gang, HODL gang. Yeah. Huddle Gang? I haven't seen that one, but what domain are we talking in? Uh, did you not know there's a series of rap music associated with uh, uh, cryptocurrencies? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and people talk about being in the Huddle Gang. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know about okay. this. So it started as a misspelling like pwn or own, prawn and snake, but it means? It means to hold on to your cryptocurrencies even though the times are rough. Yep. Or stock. Oh, okay. I've seen it in terms of stock a lot of times. So like weathering the storm kind of thing. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And this was kind of exciting to trace because I took it back to the... Uh, th it, this wasn't too hard. There, it goes back to a forum on Bitcoin talk. The post was, I am hodling. This is in 2013. Someone named GameCube. I am hodling. And then they go on to say, I typed that title twice because I knew it was wrong the first time. Still wrong. W slash E, whatever. So it was kind of cool to see the origin of that term HODL is is still out there. I love and that it's, it's an authentic typo etymology as well. <laughs> like that is like unambiguously, yep, I stuffed that up, but whatever, keeping it. Mm. Well, lately people have tried to give it a backronym. People say, oh, no, it really stands for, and people do this all the time, it stands for, hold on for dear life, HODL. Mm -hmm. But that's no, a, that's it's a fun backronym, sure. but yeah. <laughs> it's a fun backronym, yeah. but it's just a comical misspelling. And so if you hold on to your stocks, you are HODLing. Oh, those are fun yeah. ones. I like that. That somewhat salves the burn of losing <laughs> so awfully in the last question. <laughs> so Teflon Candidat and Pengdemic and HODL are words of the week. Thanks, everybody. If you enjoyed this show and you want to tell us how amazing we are, or if you heard us mispronounce or say anything wrong, we don't care. If you just want to talk to us, we like being talked to. You can give us questions, comments, feedback, say hi. You can get in touch with us on all the places. We are Because Lang Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, Patreon, TikTok, Clubhouse, and Substack. And you can also send us a good old-fashioned email at hello at becauselanguage.com. And if you did enjoy the show and you want to tell someone else about it, we'd really appreciate that because that's how people find things these days. No one cares about Twitter sponsoring or inserting things into your feed. It's about personal contact, isn't it all? 
And uh, so please tell a friend about us uh, if you can and if you like the show. Uh, this is something, for example, that Dustman of the podcast Salmon Stories does. He very bravely recommends it to people on Twitter. And it would also be really cool if you left us a review. Um, most important is iTunes, um, iTunes Store, where we exist as Because Language. Even if you listen to us on another app, you can log into iTunes from somewhere else and leave us a review. That'd be really cool of you, because that helps us in the rankings and that lets other people know about the show. Doing all those things will help people find us. Another way you can help us is by becoming one of our amazing patrons who support the show. Because of our patrons, we can make episodes and release them for free without any of those hell annoying ads we can also and this is one of my personal favorite things that we do with patron money make transcripts not only so that our show is accessible to people who can't hear but also so that if you ever want to you can go through and search for that one thing we said that one time in that one episode that's what transcripts do and thank you to Maya Klein of Voicing Words who transcribes all of our shows slash apologies to Maya Klein of Voicing Words who transcribes all of our shows (laughs) now finally here are some of our top patrons they are Dustin, Termi, Chris B, Chris L, Matt, Whitney, Damien, Joanna, Helen, Bob, Jack, Kitty, Lord Mortis, Elias, Erica, Michael, Larry, Bin, Christopher, Andy, Mai, James, Nigel, Kate, Jen, Nazrin, River, Nikolai, Aisha, Moe, Steele, Andrew, Manu, James, oh, I took a breath, Roger, Rianne, Jonathan, Colleen, Glyph, Ignacio, Kevin, Jeff, Dave H, Andy from Logophilius, and now Samantha! Exclamation mark. Thanks to all of our patrons for your support! Exclamation mark. Uh, our theme music has been written and performed by Drew Kropelianov, a member of Ryan Bino and Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Because language. All right, we've still got. I can see. It's so funny to watch this on Zoom because you can see when our competitors are like furiously conversing, not because you see them talking, but because you see them looking down very intently. <laughs> <laughs>